I try to tell people. And, uh, though, when they meet me, they don't necessarily agree, but I try to tell them that I really am the most boring person in the world. And the reason that is is because everyone has a different type of relationship with Jesus. You may experience him in a distant way, maybe like far away that you see him hanging on a cross, or maybe he came into your life and you kind of, by way of just humility and tenderness, you have a kind of shy relationship with God and you you don't talk to him personally too much, but you pray anyways, you know, you kind of cast out what we used to call casting out prayer. And your faith is such as it is, you know, God answers. You know, you're content with that and you you follow God to the best of your abilities and you pray to be good and you seek not to do evil and you walk with God in a humble way and God honors that. So there's nothing wrong with that. But for me, I'm a little different than a lot of people. You see, I don't really want to get involved in the world and its ways. I don't want to get involved in politics and socialism and setting up kingdoms and having these own little, you know, kind of like megalopolis churches or even a mini church, you know. What I really want to do is I want to talk about Jesus, you know. And unfortunately, that seems to bore people. You see, I want to talk about having a personal relationship with God. I want to know what God's involved in and how he's doing things. You know, it's like the world may be here and we may live in it, but that's just secondary to what I'm interested in. I'm interested in how God is working in it. Like, how did he intervene in the government things, you know, that were going on during the Arab Spring? How did God move in the hearts and the minds of the people, you know, as he showed that, hey, at any point in time, you know, they could close the streets of Hormuz and that that's not a reason to worry, but you could trust in the Lord with all your heart that God is doing something and he's just changing people's minds and turning them from one focus to another and that they run around kind of like chickens with their heads cut off because they're all panicking and they don't have trust in the Lord. They have no hope. Hmm. Seems to me like, you know, you don't have to worry about those things because if you didn't have a television and you weren't watching the news or checking the internet, you wouldn't even know what was going on. So, to me, talking about God is more important than talking about my Harley, which I don't have. So if you have a Harley, you know where I'm coming from. Or the latest football game or baseball game, you know, and all that other garbage, you know. And, oh, how you had a hangnail at work, you know. And you met somebody, you know, and they, they were able to fix it for you. I mean, no offense, but there are people out there for that. <laughs> I'm not one of them. So, praise the Lord, we have varieties of people that are in the kingdom of God. I just don't happen to be one of them that's interested in the nitty-gritty details unless I can turn it around somehow from inside out and look at God and see how he worked in that hangnail that you had at work. Oh, yeah, and I was, you know, kind of looking at my hangnail and I started talking to him about how God designed the hangnail and the fingernail and the finger and... Oh, he's got it all purposely planned out, you know, so that I'd be able to use it in a certain way, you know. And in other words, you see what I'm saying? I'm not there just to present the gospel. I'm there to really talk about what I do every day, <laughs> which is talk to God. So, Paul, in today's devotion, I wrote something that, frankly, I don't think is going to make anybody too happy. As a matter of fact, I think it's going to piss some people off. Because, you see, if I look at the world today, Christianity per se, it kind of looks like they're all passing around the hat. You know, they kind of want you to give something so that they can have it. It's kind of like you or me passing around our hat, like we want to get something. Like, you know, people want to get the American dream. You know, they want to have their house, their home, their retirement. And it's funny because, you know, when the baby boom generation started retiring, suddenly there wasn't retirement accounts there anymore, like Social Security or retirement accounts that were set up by 
companies that were supposed to last forever, that people were going to invest in their company, putting all their time and energy into their favorite company so that they could retire with benefits after 50 years of faithful service. They were rewarded for serving their company by bankruptcy and the retirement accounts aren't there anymore. Gee whiz. That doesn't surprise me. Because you see, I don't know where this idea of retirement came from. I don't really, I never really kind of conceived of it. I always thought we were going to die. <laughs> we were going to live. And so in between the time, we spent that time talking about and sharing and relating to God as he works in our life. Like, I don't completely get this whole idea of going out and getting a career and then adding God to it. It's kind of like, you know, Lord, what do you want me to be when I grow up? Not what do I get to pick to grow up into, and then God, I want you to be there. You see my point? I kind of don't understand where evangelical Christianity has gone to to become more satisfied in the world than dissatisfied with the world. I don't understand it. Almost seems like they kind of losing their hair. Like they got their hand out and their hat out in order to become more like the world and to become like Jesus. Because I think we're supposed to be in the world, but not of the world. In the devotional today, like I said, it's not real pleasant. It's something Jesus said that, frankly, makes a difference in your life and mine. At least for me it does. Now, I don't know about your life. Maybe you have cars, two-car garage, you know, houses and homes and rental units and all these other things that God bless you if he's given them to you. Hey, okay. I thought that once you were given something, you were supposed to give it away. But I may be wrong on that. Maybe I didn't read the Bible right. <laughs> uh, it's supposed to be that I make enough money so that when I have my extra money I got, then I pass it out. So if I have two coats, you know, I don't, like, you know, wait until I got three. Then I give one away because, after all, i got to keep two coats, right? The offense of the cross. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. I recently started watching a minister. I don't know if he's going to come up to the same conclusion that I did, but in his life of faith, he started off as a pastor. And he went out, you know, and got involved. I mean, this is paraphrasing. I don't know that much about him, but this is what I'm guessing. He went out and got saved, you know, and then he got into ministry, and then God blessed his ministry, and his ministry exploded. So he was, like, huge all over the place. He was, like, loved by his congregation, found faithful to the Word, and he kept reading the Word and studying, and like most Jesus people, you know, or Jesus freaks, you know, he kind of kept getting into the Word. And, but as he got into the Word, he kind of got thinking about it, too. He started going, I'm seeing things in here that I don't think I'm teaching right about. Matter of fact, I'm seeing things in here that I don't feel right about in my life. And so what he did was that he began to then suddenly deal with God on a personal basis. He began to look a little closer at this holy God that he started thinking, hey, you know what? We don't have it all up here, you know? We may have had all these answers that we've been told for centuries, but we don't have it all up here. God has it all up there. He's the one who gives us in here what we need to know. And so as he began to examine these things, he began to apply them to his life because that was the kind of person he was. And so one day, he walked away from a mega ministry. Maybe some of you know what I'm talking about. Maybe you don't. But you see, I think of it as he decided to take up his cross and follow Jesus. He decided to go out into the world and to put the reality check of living out 
the teachings that Jesus said as opposed to preaching some kind of worldly, sneaky little bit of compromise into the ministry, which is basically where we're at today. I see pastors that are wealthy beyond measure, while I see poor people starving without comfort. And it may be true that some of what they've done is reaping what they've sown, but Jesus never said that we weren't supposed to care. He never said that we weren't supposed to take the coat off our back and give it away. So part of me looks at the message that Jesus said, if any man come after me, let him deny himself. I don't know where that denial stops. You see, I kind of looked at my life and I don't like some of the things that I have and I'm one of the poorest of poor. I'm probably the smallest of small. I'm probably the tiniest of ministries, you know. And yet I've taken everything I've got and thrown it out to the wind, constantly going at it with everything I've got. My wife knows we take what we got and we try to keep small what little bit we use for ourselves and keep pushing it into the ministry. Keep pushing it out there free, always. Never asking for anything in return to just keep sharing Jesus the best way we know how with all that we got. To just keep trying to say, hey look, don't be satisfied with where you're at. Go for more. <laughs> it's cool. <laughs> the more that you get, the more you want. But not of possessions because they possess you. So you need to kind of cut down you know, and cut out all this extra junk because if you're anything like a gardener, then you know that once you plant something in a pot, that little sucker is going to overgrow. Put a little water on it, a little sunshine, man, that thing grow overgrown. But if you trim it, it bears more fruit. Same with your life. Have you denied yourself lately? You may have done it when you were 20 years ago as a Christian, but have you suddenly accumulated, like, we're now going on Christian cruises because it's the thing to do. We go on Christian uh, vacations because it's a Bible teaching with the vacation. Do we go on our little compromised way of the world that we now sit around on cruise ships, you know, because, oh, we have our morning devotionals and Bible studies, but we also have all those people that are working on the cruise line serving us. Who came to be served and who came to serve? I don't think Jesus would have gone on a cruise line. Can I ask you that? Can you ask yourself that? Would Jesus have gone on an Alaska cruise line for worship? <gasps> Oh, but it's so special. We have such a special worship time. Really? Would Jesus do that? Or would he take people with him on a boat that couldn't afford it? You see, I can't go on a cruise. Probably never be able to afford it. Am I bitter? <laughs> Heck no, man. I got more than what those guys got. <laughs> oh, shit. So, talking about this, am I bitter? <laughs> uh-uh, man, I already know better. <laughs> I know better than to be bitter, and I know better than to get involved in that stuff. Because, you see, for their faith, maybe they need to go on those cruise ships, you know, to write it off their taxes, and maybe they need to go do those things so that they can get a little more faith, a little more encouragement, a little more something. Oh, but it changed my life, really. So why are you going back again? Are you sending someone else instead? Are you paying for someone else to go? Or are you going? So you see, I wonder, when we talk about take up your cross, do you really take it up? Or do you just customize it so that it hangs around your neck? The question you have to ask yourself is, how is the Spirit of God leading you? I'm not here to give you a guilt complex. I don't think it's that hard to do. I read Matthew and I feel guilty. And then I just go to God and say, okay, God, you know, what do you want to do about it? And then God comes back to me and says, know you not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is an enemy of God. Hmm. You know, looking at the political system, I wonder about it. 
How do you get Christianity into politics when it's a matter of the kingdom of God and the heart? How do you get Christian politicians, you know? I can understand there being politicians, and I can understand there being Christians, but I don't understand the two merged. I can understand how a Christian could be a politician, and we could pray that other politicians get saved, but I don't understand being motivated to make it a religious application, meaning the politics itself is the part you want to be in. I don't see it. I see men and women of God praying for a nation. I don't see men and women of God using God for the nation. But then again, I don't vote. I pray for every single person God puts in office. And I expect and accept and pray for the decisions that they make when they're in office. This is not my home. And I'm just passing through. But are you? Are you investing in the kingdom of God? Or are you investing in your 4-H IRA, your retirement accounts, your all your pleasures that you get along the way? And each one of us have them. You know, I decided a long time ago, when I was a baby Christian, I said, you know, everyone has their own little things they want to do. You know, you know your to-do list. You know, nowadays they call it like the bucket list. You know, the the things you want to accomplish. You know, in your life that you want to have done, because we all have a selfish part of our life, don't we? If you're honest, if you're truthful with yourself, we all have a part of us that is selfish and is personified. Because in other countries, they would be happy sometimes with not even a bucket list, but just a bucket. Because <laughs> after all, a bucket, you can use it to carry water, you can carry food, you could even, pardon me, take a dump in it. But Anyways, the point being is that you could sit on it, you could use a bucket for a lot of things. But we choose to use the bucket as a bucket list for our wants that we want to do before we die. So you kind of get this bucket list going, you know, and you got to accomplish all these outrageous things because we were watching the world as it told us we should have a bucket list. I thought we had a cross. I thought we had a preaching to do and a teaching to do. I thought we had discipleship. As a matter of fact, I don't even understand how we compromise to accept a bucket list in our life. We must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. I thought we were already there. Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Unto you, therefore, who believe, he is precious. But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disavowed, the same is made the head of the corner, and the stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense. God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified, unto me and I unto the world. Can you say that? I can't. I can't say that. And I wrestle with that. And I know that pastor I talked about at the beginning does the same. I am not crucified to the world. Are you? Are you really? Let's be real. What's it mean? Think about it before you answer. Are you crucified to the world? Meaning that, have you denied yourself? Has everything been taken away from you? And now you are just living at the pleasure of God. The absolute necessity of trusting in the Lord. Some of you might, because you may have had a flood or a disaster come along and wiped out your little house of cards. You know, Suddenly you realized all those things weren't that important. I'm sorry you had to learn it that way. The rest of us, though, what are you doing? Are you occupying Christianity? Have you become one of those occupiers to just go in and sit and demand your rights? I want my bucket list. I want my Christian cruise. I want my rap music. I want my worship. I want my iPod. I want my cell phone. I, 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 I. 
How are you crucified? To the world. Is it the latest fad? Because we know there are a lot of fads out there, like the whosoevers, you know, I mean, I've seen more atheists call themselves whosoevers lately than the whosoevers call themselves whosoevers. Fascinating. They thought it was cool. They didn't realize it was religious. There might be a point there somewhere. <laughs> so, am I glorying in the cross or in my latest gimmick? The reality is, am I crucified to the world that I could put down my steel guitars and I could put down my amplifiers and I could put down my crowds and my audiences and I could take somebody like you one-on-one -on -one, and we could go somewhere and talk about Jesus and give up the ministry for the sake of that. Like I said, I wrestle with that. Do you? I pray about that. Do you? I'm concerned about that. Are you? Because I wonder, when Jesus said occupy till he comes, I don't think he meant occupy Christianity. I don't think he meant occupy the church. I don't think he meant occupy yourself with yourself and your wants and desires and needs. But I think he intended you to occupy the space with your light that you would shine forth into the midst of a wicked and perverse generation that in these latter days you would be the one people would come to in need, and you would minister to them like Joseph did when he was in charge of the storage range, storage grains. He would be the one you might want to look at your life as. Are you ministering to those in need around you? Or are you giving it to the church and let them do the job? I wonder. When you occupy, do you have your hand out? wanting everyone to fill it for you. Pass the hat. Give me what you got. I want it. Jesus said in the world we would have tribulation. He said we would overcome by going through it. Are you preparing for disasters? by getting your little nut together, you know, the savings account of gold bullion stashed aside so that you're safe and secure. Nobody can touch my gold. I just wonder. Jesus said it. Have you been crucified to the world and the world crucified to you? When you deal with Jesus, the hardest thing I'm going to tell you is the reality is he means what he says and says what he means. He didn't make it up. It wasn't like he decided one day to make it easy on us. That, oh, I'm going to give them grace so that even though I'm going to bust their chops with these words, I'm going to let them slide in safe into home base. Because after all, they tried to get around first and they missed the base. They tried to get around second, you know, and they didn't know where they were at, so they ran out in the center field. And then they came back and they were heading towards third, you know, and by golly, you know, since they tried, you know, I'm going to slide them into safe at home base. Maybe that works for you. Or maybe, maybe you'll be like that pastor I talked about. Me personally, I'm seeking to look at his life a little bit closer. His name is Francis Chan. I want to know if he comes to the same conclusions I do, that maybe we, as a last generation, aren't doing what Jesus said, like they did in the first generation. Maybe there's a reason why we are the last and not the first, because we couldn't answer the call that Jesus said which was the only altar call that he gave.
And it wasn't one that you must admit that you're a sinner. <gasps> it wasn't, oh, you must admit that there are four spiritual laws. <gasps> you must admit that you need God in your life. <gasps> it wasn't this way of getting saved. Rush forward and ask God into your life and He'll take over the controls of your life. <gasps> I think He said, if any man come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. I think He said, you must be born again or you shall not enter the kingdom of God. I think He said that He would send the Holy Spirit to reveal the truth. I think He said that the Holy Spirit would come inside us to cause us to remember the things that Jesus said. I think he said, you know, maybe that will help you. Maybe that's what you should do today in your devotion. Think about what Jesus said and not about what you heard.